If you think back to the beginning of our faith, that faith began with 50 days of incredible, unpredictable, amazing experiences. Beginning with the murder of Christ, followed by the resurrection of Christ, and 50 days later, <clears throat> followed by the incarnation of the Holy Spirit with us. Think of it emotionally in these terms, the adoration of the living Christ, the fear and terror now that Christ was no longer with us physically. The jubilation when Jesus manifests himself in the spirit, the confusion of all these events in the history of the Christian faith, fear, adoration, jubilation, confusion, what could be more typical of the history of the church? One of my favorite novels is a novel called Cold Sassy Tree, written by Olive Ann Burns. Burns lived in Commerce, Georgia, in the northwestern corner of the state, northeastern corner of the state. And actually, the book is uh, based on the common everyday life of people places in Commerce, Georgia. The story centers on Rucker Blakesley. <clears throat> He's 59 years old. He owns the general merchandise store in Cold Sassy Tree. He has a woman half his age who has become his clerk named Love Simpson, and his wife has just died. The funeral is conducted, and three weeks later, Grandpa Blakesley marries the woman half his age who worked in his general merchandise store. I know you're thinking this is just a, su a typical Southern trashy novel, but actually it's much more profound than that. The entire town is, of course, scandalized that he is marrying three weeks after his wife's funeral. His son will have nothing to do with them, his daughter-in-law writes him out of the family, and the only person who will even talk to him is his 14-year-old grandson, Will Tweedy. Will does not so much believe or disbelieve in his grandpa as he is just terribly confused. He asks his grandfather to tell him why everyone in the town dislikes him, why his father and mother will no longer speak to him. And grandpa, Blakesley tries to define not only his situation, but our human situation. Will, living life is like trying to pour water out of a tumbler into a dang Coca-Cola bottle. If you're scared, you just can't do it. In a sense, that could be the theme of our times. If you're afraid, you just can't do it. The biblical equivalent of scared is to be fearful, to be afraid, to be terrified. In those first days after the murder of Christ, that is a good description of the 12 disciples. They were scared. They simply couldn't do it anymore. They'd given up. And then that suddenly and dramatically changed on the day of Pentecost, when the indwelling of the Spirit of God restored their confidence, just as the resurrection had begun that process of re restoration. The biblical equivalent to scared, fear, is used 600 times 
in the Bible. That's a lot of times. Fear not is used more than a hundred times. As in, I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid, which is what Jesus told his disciples the day before his death. I'm neither a prophet nor a futurist. And so I understand these things from the standpoint of American history. Although American history is an awful lot like the stories in the Bible. Take, for instance, the decades between 1900 and 1930. The 20th century began with unprecedented optimism about the future. It's easy to understand why if you're an American historian. 20 years of idealism were then shattered by a great world war and by the greatest plague since the bubonic plague of the Middle Ages. What was all optimism and joy and certainty was suddenly all dismay and tragedy and fear. But then what followed those two decades was the Roaring Twenties, a period of hedonism, narcissism, materialism, drugs, gangsters, materialism, financial and political corruption, all culminating in the worst depression in American history. Sort of reminds you of ancient wisdom, whom the gods would destroy, they first make mad with power. If I were conducting a poll in this congregation this morning to determine your least favorite years in your lifetime, I would predict that a fair number of you would say 2020, 2021, 2022. Certainly life would have been worse other times for some of you, but as a collective experience of a nation, can you imagine a time more horrific than the time in which we live? War, pandemic, collateral disruption in every life, in every family, have left us in some ways shaken, uncertain, confused, and afraid. After 18 months of the pandemic, there was a poll asking Americans how they had reacted to what was going on in America. 84% said their lives were hard, or very hard. What else in recent memory have we spent so much time and thought trying to decide when to wear a mask? I can remember a time in my life when I was a little boy, always the new person in a town where my family had just arrived, and everyone wanted me to be the outlaw, the one who wore the mask. Somehow I can't get that mask thing out of the memories of my childhood. I don't want to wear that thing. The national mood in America seems light years removed from the optimism and sense of mastery and control over our fate, which characterized the first two decades of this millennium. Historical patterns, patterns such as our present one cause an awful lot of people just to lose hope. Where can God be? in the times of our discontent. Has God abandoned us? Has God given up on us? If we understand God as we understand ourselves, human history, that conclusion really makes a lot of sense. 
When you have two years like the last two years, why not think, God must really have something against us. And if we are searching for theological or biblical evidence of such a conclusion, you can find it on virtually every page of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. The beginning of the 20th century, however, was quite a different story. In 1900, America was full of optimism, dreams about the possibilities of the future. And why not? Think about the 1900 census and what happened in the following 100 years. Did you realize that in 1900 there were 8,000 automobiles in America? Less than 150 miles of paved roads? 5% of Americans had a high school diploma? 14% of Americans had a bathtub inside their house? I mean, there's not much to take pride in in all that. I even read a, an article in the Mobile Press Register on the last day of 1899, where the editorial writer said, a hundred years of experience teach us that we will never fly in the air as do the birds. That was three years before Kitty Hawk and the first man flight defying science. When you think about all the things that happened immediately after 1900, what about the X-ray, 1903? What about the motor-driven vacuum cleaner, 1899? Uh, Robert Goddard's early experiments with rocket engines, <clears throat> 1914. Rayon, invented 1902. Form of plastic, <clears throat> 1914. And an awful lot of people installed indoor bathtubs after 1900. <clears throat> the failure seemed destined to fulfill the wildest dreams of the human race are the highest dreams of the human race. <clears throat> Yet within two decades, <clears throat> those dreams collapsed into nightmares and the Great Depression and the pandemic, which swept the world. If you <clears throat> fast forward ahead to 1917, the young men who were training to go to war in France, it's an interesting story. There were 45 cantonment camps scattered across the United States, each with more than 20,000 soldiers preparing to go to Europe. One of those camps was Camp Sheridan in Montgomery, Alabama. It had 20,000 soldiers of the 37th Infantry Division, most from the upper Midwest. Unknown to those soldiers in January of 1917, Halfway across the continent, something truly mysterious was happening. Scientists have not yet determined exactly what happened, although we have many clues. Some trace the influenza epidemic, as it was called, to a hog farm in Haskell County, Kansas. In that hog farm, there were people who not only worked with hogs, but were also being drafted into the U.S. military. They were moving just across uh, from Haskell County to the next county in Kansas, where there was one of those huge cantonment camps, training soldiers to go to France. Haskell County, Kansas was also the flyover for 17 different varieties of birds moving from the West Coast to the East Coast. Birds can infect viruses into hogs. When they're in the hogs, there is a change in the genetic structure of the hog. That can result sometimes in a lethal 
virus. And that is how it all began. The soldiers with the influenza went to the new cantonment camp. Suddenly there were thousands of soldiers in that camp with influenza. Some of those troops came to Camp Sheridan and suddenly there was an epidemic in Montgomery of influenza. As a result, when those soldiers were sent overseas, more than half the deaths in the American Expeditionary Force fighting in World War I were not combat deaths. They were death from a worldwide influenza epidemic. 28% of Americans contracted influenza. Between 650,000 and 850,000 died from the influenza. Worldwide, the influenza killed 50 million people, making it the deadliest virus in the history of the world. Just a piece of history. The influenza epidemic triggered a spiritual pandemic as a people who had lost hope for the future decided, live today as if it is the last day you will ever have. That can be good theology, or that can be really bad theology. <clears throat> In February 1920, the influenza epidemic suddenly began to wane and then disappeared altogether. Prosperity, normality, everything back to normal in America. But instead of gratitude for deliverance, we descended into a decade characterized, at least for those who could afford it, by hedonism and excess. <clears throat> everything from popular music and fashion <clears throat> to new mo automobiles and thousands of miles of paved highways all inviting America, pack up your troubles in your old kid bag, smile, smile, smile. Ironically, a couple from Montgomery of Alabama smiled most dramatically of all, and they became a symbol of a generation that needed not to think about the past Nothing to think about, but now. Zelda Zaire was the teenage daughter of a prosperous Montgomery family. She was a teenager, shortened her dress him, mastered all the while new dances, dated five different Auburn football stars, creating a new fraternity, secretly, at first, where you could only enter if you'd had a date with Zelda Sayer. But Zelda tired of the Auburn football team and began to date a soldier, Lieutenant at Fort Sheridan. He was from Minnesota. His name was F. Scott Fitzgerald. Their marriage, his brilliant novel, The Great Gatsby, as well as their uninhibited lifestyle, epitomized the decade of the 1920s. Now, to the theology of history. Following hard times in the First World War and the 1918 and the 1920 flu epidemic, life returned to normality, as it always does. The fear spawned by such unusual events are sobering when they happen. They create fear and terror when they happen. Then, after reminding us of the transience and fragility of life, they're gone. They end. Back to normal. Don't think about it anymore. At the time, we think God has abandoned us. God is no longer relevant, and we can devote whatever time we have left to whatever pleasure we choose. Seems to be me that bad times 
such as wars and pandemics, are actually divisible into two parts. First part, fear, being overwhelmed, abandoned by God, old truths, meaningless, losing our way, having no explanation for what is happening to us. Mostly, we're just afraid. Before God provides an explanation of what is happening, God provides some eternal advice. Fear not. Do not be afraid. But then in the world where we live, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. Fear is warning, is not fear of reassurance. In some sense, fear is one of the gifts God gives us, whether we like it or not. Because there are times when God needs to warn us. The Bible contains hundreds of admonitions. Fear God. And if you think about it, fear and grief are associated with bad stuff happening in our lives, which is often the very source of our compassion and our empathy. That makes us better people. One local therapist in Auburn once told me, I know that you don't have to wait for hard times to stop being bad in order to start being happy. When you think about the Bible, and you think about how God was with Abraham, every day he was afraid from the end of the Egyptian captivity to the settlement in a new land, a promised land. Or do you remember how God told Mary, mother of Jesus, when she realized she was pregnant and not married? Fear not. And God told the shepherds caring for their flocks, fear not. Or as Jesus told his disciples the last day of his life, do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Let us never, however, forget the hundreds of references in the Bible to fear. Fear in a time like the 1920s, who knows, maybe even fear in our own time. The brilliant poet T.S. Eliot wrote an entire poem dedicated to the excesses of the 1920s. It was called The Wasteland. Ten years later, looking back on what had happened in the 1920s and looking at the photograph of that period from the perspective of the Great Depression, he wrote another poem called The Rock. And it was a spiritual obituary for the excesses of the earlier times. He ends the poem this way. And the wind shall say, here were decent, godless people. Their only monument, the asphalt road, and a thousand lost golf balls.